social um, contract that um, that Rousseau begins by saying um, man is born free but is everywhere in chains. By the eve of the French Revolution, slavery was so much on the minds of, of, of all of the French revolutionaries and they were so obsessed with what had happened with the American Revolution, which is that the American Revolution had betrayed all of the black um, residents of the what became the United States. So that what happened in 1776, which remember the French were intimately involved with, the French bankrupted their treasury to support the American Revolution. And if we were not, if it wasn't for them, uh, you know, this would be a British colony still. So the French had incredible involvement in the American Revolution and just to give you an idea of the sense of betrayal, I found a letter that Lafayette had written to Washington in 1788, um, where Lafayette, the most famous of the French uh, officers who came over to help our revolution said, you know, I would never have done this. I would never have gone if I had thought you were going to do what you're doing with slavery. If I had thought you would leave slavery intact, I would, I would never have uh, not bothered to join. I would have been ashamed to join this enterprise because it's completely hypocritical. They, they worshiped the Americans. There were uh, all kinds of um, clubs and societies formed honoring the Americans in the 1780s and this led directly into the French Revolution. They, we inspired them, but they were so disappointed and it was very interesting. They were disappointed across the board. So people like Lafayette, who is um, you know, a marquis and he comes from the aristocratic side, all the way to people like Robespierre, who was a radical and you know, wanted nothing to do with aristocrats. All of these people, the one of the few things they could agree on was that if you were going to have a revolution, you had to have racial equality. And slavery, of course, you had to get rid of, but you also had to integrate the society. So anyway, I discovered through my story you know, that there was this forgotten civil rights movement, this incredible moment of integration in the 18th century. I discovered this incredible underdog story and this man with amazing talents who rose to the top of society from slavery. So I discovered all this stuff, but um, I have to say I'm not a formal historian. And the thing is, I didn't go into my quest, into my research, with any interest in any of this stuff. Um, and I say that because it can give you maybe an idea of sort of uh, an alternate way, my way or a way that people can take to, to go about uh, uh, researching history. I just got involved in all of this because as a kid, I was a huge fan of the novels of Alexander Dumas and the movies that, in, that were inspired by it. I just, I loved The Three Musketeers, The Man in the Iron Mask, and especially The Count of Monte Cristo. This obsession led me, by the time I was um, 13, which I guess means when I was in middle school, uh, I was reading everything I could by Dumas, and I came upon this kind of strange, forgotten book, which, is the mem which are the memoirs of Alexander Dumas and the memoirs of Alexander Dumas, the writer, not the man I've been speaking about, the general. But the memoirs of Alexander Dumas are a very strange document. And they've been out of print in English since, since the 19th century. And I picked up, as a kind of antiquarian book nut, I picked up an old edition. And I read it. I started reading it. And the, the reason why it's out of print, I think, is um, can be uh, is, is because it's a very weird memoir, a very weird memoir, very uh, uh, more than unorthodox. And, I, and, and what makes it really weird is, so when I bought it, I'll give you an idea. When I bought the memoirs of Alexander Dumas, I had to buy 10 books, 10 fat volumes. He gets through almost all of volume one, past page 200, without getting to his own birth. The reason he doesn't get to his own birth till after page 200 is he wants to tell you about somebody else. And the man that he tells you about is the man that I've been telling you about. He talks about the life of his father, General Alex Dumas. The most vivid moment in the memoirs, I think, is the, the moment 
that's really the first scene where he, that he writes, that he sort of writes with that Alexander Dumas um, kind of vividness where you sort of see this is the author of The Three Musketeers here. And the scene is in fact the scene uh, of his father's death, the night that his father dies. Now before that, he's eased himself into the narrative a bit because when he's born, his main memories are, as a very, as a very young boy, living with his father at this kind of rented castle in provincial France. And it's a very strange situation because the man that I was describing to you, who is the great hero of France and who is you know, one of the most celebrated men in France, and I found tons of records from the 1790s attesting to the fact that the French Revolution and the French, um, you know, at the time when the France was triumphant, he was, the, the fact that they had this slave hero was incredibly exciting to the French army and they wrote about it and everything, but here it is, and this is taking place um, just a few years later in 1806, uh, or actually even in a little earlier in, in 1803, 1804. Here is the young writer Alexandre Dumas writing about this life where they're living in this castle and his father is a semi-broken man and he's broken because he's come back from this ordeal that he's experienced in this dungeon where he has been thrown into a dungeon and even though he's this great general his identity is stripped from him he doesn't know why he's thrown in the dungeon and he becomes merely a number and nobody is helping him to get out Remarkably, he, he finally, he was almost poisoned to death, but he finally gets out and he's living with the son in the, about 100 miles outside Paris, 100 kilometers outside Paris. And it's a very strange situation because the father is not allowed to, we know that he's a great hero, but all of his exploits are in the past, but he's still a relatively young man and he heals himself, he gets back to health, but he is not allowed to rejoin the army. And he, I would find out that the reason he's not allowed to rejoin the army is that Napoleon has taken control. While General Dumas is in the dungeon, Napoleon takes control of the government of France. And everything I've told you about for the last uh, half hour is erased from history. One of the first things Napoleon does as dictator of France uh, is to reinstate slavery throughout the French Empire. That Napoleon rose to power backed by the French sugar and slave lobby, and they wanted all of this stuff rolled back. They rolled it back, so General Dumas and his young son, the future novelist, are living in a kind of internal exile, and everything about their life by that point is illegal. It's become, miscegenation's become illegal, so General Dumas' marriage to Marie Louise is illegal, but in the memoirs, all I knew was that the son was writing his father's death scene as the first real moment of his own life and that there was this incredible sort of um, intertwining of the two at this moment and there was this, you could, this, there is in the memoir at this point, this palpable frustration, sadness, desperation that the son has that his father, the great hero that he's shown you what a great hero he was in the last 200 years, is dying now a completely forgotten and erased person. That he's dying as nothing after having become all of this. And I would find that after General Dumas dies, in fact, um, the family is sort of, uh, then they no longer are able to live in a rented castle. In fact, the, the uh, General du or Alexander Dumas, the novelist, isn't even allowed to have a high school education. Um, uh, by you know a decade later, uh, his mother is essentially selling, um, uh, working, selling magazines and cigarettes, um, sort of a very lowly station. And he is somebody who then, I mean, there's amazing talent in this family. He pulls himself up by his bootstraps and rises to become France's first their most celebrated playwright and then the most popular novelist uh, France will ever have. But throughout his life, he becomes rich, famous, celebrated. He is never able to bring the life of his father, General Dumas, 
back into public consciousness in France. He is not even able during his lifetime to fulfill his simple goal of getting a statue erected to his father in France. And this is in Paris, a city that is just, as you know, there are statues and, uh, uh, and streets named after the most obscure French generals and military figures. Um, you know, there are just hundreds of them, and, and most of them are really nothing much. I always knew in my pocket that here was this amazing, inspirational thing that had inspired some of the greatest adventure stories of all time. And these adventure stories I grew up with as a kid, but had this great tragedy at the heart of it, which was the forgotten true story, or not even forgotten, the erased true story. So in a way, it made The Count of Monte Cristo, which is already kind of a heartbreaking story, much more heartbreaking to me, because I knew there was this real man who had gained and lost so much behind it. And anyway, I um, put myself to, uh, on the trail of it a few years ago, and um, the result is The Black Cow. So um, thank you. Thank you.